African father in America. Tujikaze, tujikaze, jikaze. Tujikaze, tujikaze, jikaze. African tujikaze, father tujikaze, jikaze. in America. Tujikaze, tujikaze, jikaze. You are listening to African Father in America podcast by Simon Javanokelo, live from Seattle. Greetings, beautiful people. My name is Simon Javanokelo, and I'm excited to be here with you for another episode of uh, the African Father in America podcast. Um, it's really an honor uh, to, you know, have a conversation with the incredible uh, Dr. Rosalyn Akombe. Uh, who is joining us really at midnight, uh, you know, where she is in the east coast of the U.S. So it's really, uh, you know, something that uh, I don't take for granted. And uh, today we are going to, you know, talk about Dr. Rosalyn Akombe's story. We are going to talk about uh, what a father figure means to Dr. Rosalyn uh, Akombe. And we are going to talk about why she's a passionate political economist. Uh, and then we are going to talk about how you, the viewers and the listeners of the African Father in America podcast can also stay connected with her. So uh, in this episode, uh, I will have a conversation about the year 2021 through the story of Dr. Rosalyn Akombe, who is the chief of policy at the Policy and uh, Mediation Division, uh, Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs at the United Nations in New York. Um, in 2017, Dr. Kombe served as a commissioner with the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, IEBC. She also previously worked with the African Union as an economist. Dr. Kombe is an advocate for the protection of human, uh, for the protection of human rights, social justice, environmental protection, and inclusion of youth and women in all political and socio-economic spheres of life. Prior to her work with the African Union and the United Nations, she was an active, uh, she was really active in Kenya, in the student movement, civil society, and the women's movement in general. She continued with uh, uh, this work in the United States through Women Rising uh, and uh, focusing on economic opportunities for black women. Dr. Kombe supports several courses dedicated to social justice and the full involvement of youth and women in all aspects of life. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Nairobi and a master's and doctorate degree from Rajas University. Born in Kenya in 1976, she is a mother of two. Uh, Dr. Kombe, thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, again, you know, I don't take this for granted. And I just wanted you to, you know, share with our listeners and our viewers a story about Dr. Kombe when you are maybe 8 to 12 years old, when you had this <laughs> vision uh, that one day I'm going to be this revered political economist that so many people, including myself, really look up to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and, and really course. thanks for, for having me uh, on your show. I'm really thrilled uh, that you actually have a show that, you, that, that is entitled African Father in America. That, that, that is really great because I think uh, my story, if I go back to it, uh, revolves around uh, basically what my father and my mother really taught me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you ask me to think about uh, myself at eight years old, nine years old, or ten years old, I remember, I go back again to remembering my father, uh, who was an educator, and my mother, who was a teacher, who both really valued education very much. Mm -hmm. And I remember my father saying so many times to, to me and to my siblings uh, that, uh, you know, I would want you to go to school to study and I want to hear that, um, you know, one of you is in Ujerumani, another one is in America, another one is in the UK. Right. And we were actually thinking about it yesterday as we were celebrating his birthday mm. uh, and, and, and reminding him of that. Mm. And so whenever I remember myself, I remember those formative years when mm. my parents always uh, talked about education and the value of education. Mm -hmm. You know how it is to have a mother who's a teacher. 
yeah. uh, who doesn't spare the road. And uh, when she needed to use it, she used it very well uh, mm. to ensure that we went to school. So, you know, my memories of uh, as a child was really from the very beginning, the love for books, um, mm. the love for, for, for education, because that's all I had in my, in, my, in my home. That's what I had from my parents. And it's not like they were rich, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, struggling as a primary school teacher and uh, somebody who worked in the Ministry of Education, which is what my dad did, mm. it wasn't, uh, I wasn't brought up in a rich family. But mm. education and values of honesty and, and, and those things were really put into me mm. from the very, very early stages, uh, mm. both by my mom and my, and my dad. And, and for that, I sincerely appreciate. Wow. It's really, it, you know, this... Um, characteristics of what your parents were like permits in who you are like uh, you know your presence and your your ethics your work ethics your integrity really you know speak to some of these uh, things that you know you're saying about your parents and uh, I'm curious to just learn a little more about you know what a father figure means to you you know my dad um my dad still lives here with me i'm i'm very appreciative i'm among the very few people that mm. has has the privilege of uh, having my father with me here in the u.s mm. i don't take it for granted i have both yeah. my parents my mom yeah. and my dad both here and right. they deserve to have a better life after all they struggled to to, right. to do uh, you know to, to to bring us up but for me the things I remember most about, uh, you know, the, the figure, the father figure that I had was, um, was um, you know, I, I go back again to the values, you know. Yeah. I remember when I got, when I was, uh, when I was um, selected, uh, to, you know, when I was appointed as a commissioner and I visited uh, one of the counties where my father uh, worked and grew up, Nyamira County. Mm. And uh, I remember one old man approaching me and asking me whether I was a Combe's daughter. And mm. I said, I confirmed, I said, yes, I am a Combe's daughter. Mm. <laughs> and he said to me, oh, if you are a Combe's daughter, then I know that everything is in good hands. Because a Combe, when a Combe tells you he is, it's, it's yes, it is a yes. Mm. When he tells you it's no, it is mm. a no. <laughs> and so those that is a father that I knew, uh, the father figure that I had, somebody who really put this um, um, hard work, my dad always told us and always tells us up, tells us up to now mm. that if you put hard work, if you work hard, Mm. There's, uh, the, you know, if you have your credentials, you will always make it in life. Mm. Uh, he always, always taught us the values of, um, of, uh, of really honesty. Mm. I remember him telling us, you know, or seeing us, actually seeing it all the time in him. You know, mm. at one point he was heading the supplies, you know, head of mm. supplies in the Ministry of Education in Kisi, mm. Kisi District. It was then called Kisi District. Mm. And, you know, these are the times when they had textbooks and rulers and pencils mm. there are times i would not have a pencil or a, or a ruler but mm. my dad would never take any of those things from the kenya school equipment scheme that's how mm. it used to be called and to give us we would struggle my mother would would break a small piece of a pencil and share it with all of us but my dad would never ever uh take any of the things that uh that, that were there that that he he was in charge of supply of sending mm. to schools mm. so so for me the father figure that i see is that person who who really showed us the value of working hard we saw mm. him struggle and it was never easy mm. uh we saw him you know provide uh, a living for us but he also taught us that there was no difference between his girls and boys right. my father never treated us differently he treated the girls just the same way he treated the boys. And so right. we grew up knowing that the potential that I have as a, as a young girl uh, is, is a, the potential that my brothers have. And so we were brought up in a unique family growing up, uh, you know, in, in the 80s, right. um, seeing, you know, these roles uh, where my father would go to the kitchen and cook for us, just mm. the same way that my mother would cook for us. Mm. So I didn't grow up with the same, you know, I, I have been shocked in life, actually, 
seeing that people that their lines their borders because i never grew up with those Right. I mean, of course, there were challenges. I'm not trying to create a picture here of a, of a family that was uh, that, that was living in that, that was perfect. We had our struggles as a, as a, as a family that seven of us and and my my parents' salaries couldn't necessarily you know pay for everything that that we had. Yeah. We we benefited from the generosity of of strangers who made mm. sure that our our school fees was paid uh, when when we needed to. Mm -hmm. And we struggled uh, as any family would struggle. But I think for me, the father figure that I saw is, mm. is, is a man who believed in hard work and who still believes in hard work. He yeah. works up to now, you mm. know, despite the fact that he has, you know, he doesn't have to work. Mm. He has all of us to take care of him, but he wakes up and goes to work yeah. at 71. So those are the values really that I, that I cherish all the time. Wow. So it sounds like you have siblings and also... It's, you know, it's just for me amazing to see how driven you are, you know. Um, what is it that is driving you, that is, you know, making you wake up every morning and just, you know, keep it moving, as they say here in the diaspora? Um, I, want, I want you to speak to that. And also, you know, I want you to, to speak to the African fathers here in America and African fathers back home, you know. Um, what would you say to them in just one minute? Yeah, I mean, what makes me wake up in the morning? I think it's the belief that we are all here on this earth mm. for purpose. That there's mm. something that, that, that uh, whether you believe in God or whether you believe in the cosmic, um, you know, uh, nature, or which, whatever it is, yeah. there is a reason for which we are here on this earth. And, yeah. and I am I'm a Christian, so I believe very strongly that God didn't put me here for nothing. There is yeah. a purpose, and, and that is the purpose that I wake up every morning to try and fulfill. Yeah. I try to, to make our lives better. Uh, you know, that is, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very I'm a strong optimist. I believe that I don't believe in giving up on things. I believe that every, every effort, things might be hard, but you've mm. got to push it. You've got to wake up every day, and you've got to push the limits. Right. And um, you asked me about uh, the yeah, fathers the, back, the, back yeah. home. And, I wanted to actually explain why I was asking that, because yes. this podcast is called the African Father in America podcast, and it started in May uh, last year, and it's because of the coronavirus pandemic that I started it. I felt mm -hmm. stuck at home, and in February, right before we went on lockdown globally, um, there's a Kenyan friend of mine that committed suicide in Vancouver, you know. He was a father of young kids like myself, you know. I have three kids. And so I wanted to do something that uh, would allow me to speak up and share my story, but also inspire other fathers to share their stories. And so um, I wanted you to just, you know, hear a little bit of that, uh mm. and you know just also imagine how difficult last year was uh and mm. the, you know in kenya and also the african culture in general the expectations for men is always exaggerated you know and so there are a lot of uh young men that are having mental issues that are going through difficulty um that nobody knows about you know and so imagine that you're speaking to them, you know, in you as a personality, you are considered a father figure too. <laughs> so speak to your sons. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, the same, and I'm, I'm really sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for the loss of your, of your, of your friend in, in, in Vancouver. And I'm proud of you for, for, for responding this way because there are different ways you can respond to a loss, right? There are different ways yeah. you can respond to a situation like that. And to respond by having dedicating this to him is really a testament to your strength. And, and so I just want to applaud you. But I also want to applaud you, really, for, for being a father, for, for, for raising your children. We have so many deadbeat dads out there. And so yeah. anytime I find young people like you taking charge, taking responsibility, I'm, I'm just so proud of you. So, so just to say, you know, Thank this you. is really, this is really great. Thank I you. mean, yes, I, I, 
I think we, we we put a lot of sometimes we put a lot of unnecessary pressure on uh, on all of us. I mean, yes, it's men, it's it's all of us. But I think what we have done over the years is that we have spent a lot of time focusing on women and empowerment of women, mm-hmm. and not prepared the men for how they will live in that in that society. Mm-hmm. So you 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 find that we spend a lot of time. For many years, you know, we spent a lot of time adjusting our our society really mm. to accept men and women, uh, especially to carve out the space for for men, for women in society, mm. which was not there in most of the places. Yeah. But then we didn't prepare the young men for how then they will respond to this um, to this situation, and 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 I think that is where we need to be spending a lot of time on, which we are not doing. Mm. We're not spending enough time to be able to bring up young men uh, who will be able to adjust to this to this life. How do you deal with a situation like this? How do you mm-hmm. deal, you know, with the, a more assertive, uh, you know, partner in your life? Mm-hmm. And and I, and I think you know I'm bringing up a son. Uh, you know, I have already a daughter yeah. who, who who actually it's interesting. I she did a podcast she is a that podcaster. I share with you. Talk about she her a, for a minute. She please. did uh, she did an interesting <laughs> podcast about masculinity. Actually. I heard it uh, <laughs> and uh, and yeah. talking about what she felt what her experiences mm. in my in my household and mm. and in my family <laughs> in the larger family and yeah. listening to it it struck mm. me that there are things that i did and i didn't even notice that mm. i'm reinforcing stereotypes mm. uh by by doing that and and mm. it's it's enlightened me a lot listening to joy and camilla in that in that in that podcast but yeah. just to say that i think there's a lot of pressure we end up putting on men because we're not preparing them especially the young men we're right. not preparing them to the society in which they're going to live in we're not uh, preparing them for the assertiveness that they're going to find in the young women they're going to have in their lives. And 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 so what I try to do with my son is really to try and make him, first of all, take away the pressure that there is, I don't expect differently from you. What I expect from, from Joy, the same expectations I have for, for my daughter are the same expectations I have for you. I don't have bigger expectations for you because you're a man, you're a young man. I have the same expectations for you. She has gone to New York University. I expect you to go to New York University. Nothing less, mm-hmm. you know, and nothing more, <laughs> you know. So, so I, I try to, you know, it's 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 again about that. It's about how we raise our, you know, the young men in our families, in mm-hmm. our homes, mm-hmm. not to not to have too many expectations, uh, to, you know, the pressures that we put on them that you should have married by this age, you should have been the one paying dowry. Who says Joy should not? pay dowry to to the young man that she's going to bring you why should it why should i expect dowry why should i expect mm-hmm. simon to pay dowry mm-hmm. you know like like it's 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 some of these pressures <laughs> that we end up putting on the young man uh that that end up frustrating them because you're putting more and more expectations mm-hmm. uh higher and, and higher expectations they're not preparing them i mean and the economy is tough mm-hmm. it's you're true dealing with a situation in which the economy, whether you're looking at the economy here or you're looking at the economy in Kenya, mm-hmm. it's tough. And to then raise, continue having these very high expectations without right. adjusting to the economic environment is, uh, is actually a disservice we're doing to the young men. It's true. It's true. So I hope, you know, all those young fathers and young men, both here in the diaspora and in Kenya, have listened. Um, you know, I, I just want to let you know that I really prepared for our conversation today and I was nervous at the beginning. You know, I was like, what am, what can I discuss with Dr. Rosalina Combe? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really humbling that we're actually having a conversation. And, you know, for those who are just joining us, I'm really here with somebody that I value. Uh, and I want you to follow her on Twitter at Dr. Rosalina Akombe and also follow me on Twitter at... Javan Okelo and uh, today we've just been talking about Dr. Rosalie Nakombe's story uh, we now uh, you know are talking about what father what a father figure means to Dr. Rosalie Nakombe and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about what her passion uh, you know her political economic uh, economist passion where it comes from uh, you know 
I've, I've seen pictures and stories of you online when you are, uh, you know, a leader in Nairobi University. And uh, then your pictures and videos about you as a commissioner at the IEBC, you know. And I've, I've, I've never, you know, I, I just want you to know that I have a, a lot of love and respect for you because it's a hard job that you did, you know. I just want you to know if you've never been given, you know, genuine love and appreciation, I want to give it to you as Simon because you really gave a service to Kenya and, and Africa and, and me and my family, you know. <laughs> so your integrity is valued and, and really what you did was amazing. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And... I want you to speak about Kongamano Lama uh, Just speak to, you know, what it means to you and why it's important in 2021 as we are going into a new decade. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Simon. And really thanks for those, for those kind words. Um, you know, sometimes you do a job and you don't realize uh, the, the impact that it has. And uh, yeah. as I keep saying that I went into that job really hoping to make a difference. I... I, you know, I had done a lot of work elsewhere in the world and, and I thought I have made enough contribution to the rest of the world. Let me go back home and uh, put my best foot forward. But it's a different environment. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging environment. It's one in which um, integrity, the price of integrity is very high, right. uh, as, 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 as we've, all, we've all seen. But um, so you ask me about Kongamano Lama Right. You know, it actually goes back again to 2017, right? Mm. Um, you know, so so what you have in Kongamano Lama is a movement, uh, a group of people, uh, political parties, three political parties. That is the United Green Movement, um, the Communist Party of Kenya, and Kweli Party. As you know, as well as several um, non-government organizations, civil society organizations, and individuals that have come together and said, "We can't just be placed into two categories: that you are either kieleweke or tanga tanga. Right. Life is better; is more than that. That that we Kenyans can be better than that. That we can be able to provide alternatives and alternative political views." That right. the progressive voice that was always carried by Right Honorable Raila Odinga, which has now moved and married with uh, the Jubilee Party, is no longer existent. Right. And that progressive voice needs to be heard. And that those progressive forces need to find leadership somewhere. And that is mm -hmm. what really Kongamano Lama Geuzi is about. It's about providing an alternative to Kenyans so that you don't have, you're not stuck into these um, binaries of having to choose between Uhuru Raila camp or the Ruto camp. So you don't have right. to belong to those, to either of those. You can belong to Kongamano Lama that right. really is trying to provide an alternative, that is trying to, to really say, we can have better politics than this, that we can use this as a way of getting electoral justice, looking at the environmental issues, we can use this to to bring up the voices of young people. And what you mm. see in Kongamano is really a very interesting dynamic where you have young people uh, who are saying, this is our country, we are taking mm. back the country. Mm. And you, Rosalina Kombe and uh, Dr. William Tunga and others who caused the mess that we are in, the older mm. generation, that is, mm. you mm. have to help us fix this. You know, you have to help us. Let's work together to fix this mess that we have created over the years. And really, right. that's what we're trying to do. It's come right. together, generational, in, you know, intergenerational. Of the older people, I consider myself now an older person, given right. that I have a 21-year-old. 20 year I qualify to be in that category. Yeah. And, and the younger ones, the 21-year-olds, the 28-year-olds, who wanted a better vision for the country. Right. And trying to see how can we work together to give Kenyans other options, to give them a third option, so that they don't have to be stuck between the two groups that are there, and that you maintain a, a progressive force that is able to push against the BBI initiative that is trying to bring back the imperial presidency, that is able to push for progressive policies that are going to ensure that you have a, 
a people-centered e economic structure, not yeah. one that we have right now. We can't continue in this path whereby, can you imagine, imagine Simon, that we have a situation in which 97% of Kenyans mm. earn less than 30,000 shillings a month. That is 97% of Kenyans earning, you know, making like what, $300? Yeah, it's, it's, it's so <laughs> true. It's so true. And that's really, that's really what Kongamano is trying to yeah. do. That's what Kongamano is trying to push for. Yeah. Man, um, you know, I've, I've, with the work I've been doing with One Vibe Africa, the times when we used to hire like 20 people full time, now we we don't we only have like three people full time uh mm. and it's it's hard for organizations and ideas mm. to thrive in an environment in a political environment like Kenya you know so mm. it's really great that a movement like Hongamano Lamagiuzi is is being developed and uh you know people who are listening and uh watching have heard I wanted you to just, you know, take us, take us down three, three years ago, you know, uh, when, when you were actually a commissioner at the IABC. And, you know, there, there's a story that I wanted to share about a moment in my upbringing in Kisumu. You know, I grew up in Manyata in the slum where, uh, you know, something could scare you in a way that you'd think that something will never scare me like this again in my life, you know. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, something else scares you. So you, 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 you become so resilient and so, uh, mm -hmm. so fearless, you know. Some, uh, and so, you know, there's a time we are playing hide and seek in our neighborhood. And there's a taxi driver who, do you know Sakati? This round-shaped uh, buildings, uh, you know, in the slum, that in yes. the yeah there's a space where a car can also park in that little yes. space so a taxi driver who is a neighbor had their car parked there and we were playing hide and seek and one of my colleagues threw a rock and it broke the windshield and we didn't know that this neighbor was a crazy neighbor so he just grabbed a somali sword and started chasing us little kids in the neighborhood and so mm. i thought this is terrible you know and mm. You know, that was just like a chain of other events that growing up in the slum can expose you to. But working at the IABC was a situation where somebody's life was taken brutally in a way that it can scare you, similar to how we were scared as kids growing up in Manyata, or how somebody who is growing up in you know, Syria right now is scared that, the, you know, any time their life could end, you know, and you persevered after the, the brutal murder of Chris Musando and uh, continued serving for several weeks. You, you had so many challenges, your life was in danger. You know, I can't imagine how you went through that. Can you just paint a picture uh, just for a second of like how it felt for for you know, for people who are watching to have an idea of how difficult those moments can be for somebody. Yeah. I mean, first, I, I, I always, uh, you know, get really pleased when I see people who've grown up in places like Manyata coming out <laughs> and being here. I mean, just, just, just give yourself. It's you know, crazy. You to add to yourself on the back when you do that. I, I you know. We live in Dunga, so yeah, so, it's so, crazy. So, so, so Dunga is nothing close to to, to Manyata, but uh, but but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean the the um, I mean the story of 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 uh, the brutal murder of, of of Chris Misando is is I think one that that uh, you know will live with me forever. I I have been in in war zones. I have worked in, you know, I have flown into Somalia when there are mortar attacks. I have gone into Afghanistan. I've gone into Iraq. I, you know, so, so I, you know, I have, I have led a team into Libya where we had, uh, you know, a, a bomb attack uh, mm. just before we got to the airport. So I, you know, I didn't take the job 
thinking that it's a light one. I, right. you know, I have been in dangerous sports uh, before. I, you know, I, I have lost colleagues of mine uh, in the line of duty, mm. but they were not deliberately murdered. Right. They were you not know, deliberately murdered by people who were meant to protect them. Uh, if they were murdered, it was by terrorists uh, who were against what we were doing. But, but, but this really, you know, when you see there's nothing as horrible as getting walking into a morgue and seeing the body of your own staff, somebody that you yeah. have worked with, and with a sort of um, um, torture and, and the wailing of uh, ever asking me, Commissioner, why did you kill Msando? Why did you kill my husband? What am I going to tell my children? Right. I remember and, those videos. And of course, um, you know, as, as you know, he was my staff. Uh, and that's one thing that people forget, that, you know, there's a sense of responsibility you feel, that uh, you, you couldn't protect your own staff, mm. uh, that, uh, that uh, you, as a commissioner, were aware of the threats uh, that that uh, you know I was aware I had seen the threats I had seen the text messages I had received the same mm. uh, but but honestly I think we downplayed it we we never at one no point did I think that those threats would would lead to Chris being murdered yeah. or that those threats that we were receiving at the point were going to translate into a murder of anybody yeah. and and so you know. I live with the regret of, yeah. I wish I had spoken up at that time, uh, yeah. in May, in April, you know, when, when, when we started receiving the threats, uh, yeah. you know, that, that if we had spoken up, if I had raised the alarm bells, maybe Chris wouldn't have been killed. Right. And that is something that, uh, you know, that is a regret that I will always have uh, with me. It will live with me. Um, and, and so when people ask me why I keep bringing up the issue of, of Chris, mm. I bring it so that you don't forget, that you right. don't forget that right. there are people who are in office, who are sitting in office right now because they got their victory out of the murder of a young man, you know, mm. that, uh, that uh, th there is justice that hasn't been served, that uh, there are many of us who are part and parcel of that process and were never interviewed uh, at all, that there was never any attempt to find justice uh, and, and to, you know, to, 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 to figure out, to even give a sense of a process that, that, that was being done to try and understand, uh, you know, what, what happened. And so, and so, yeah, so that is something that, you know, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I wouldn't wish on anybody to have to go to city mortuary to view the body of their loved one. Or mm -hmm. their staff it's something that will always uh remain with me for many many months i couldn't sleep without lights on in my in my bedroom i had to turn i could barely sleep because every time you you know you get into bed you just have the image of your own stuff lying right. there on that cold slab right. and 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 so so it's 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 i hope that at some point you know whether right. now 10 years 15 years that all the information that has been collected thankfully Kenyans speak. Thankfully, Kenyans write. Thankfully, Kenyans share information. So this is not one of those uh, cold uh, cases. This is a case that there is evidence. Right. Even those people who, you know, well trained somewhere to do this work were not so good in covering their tracks. Right. So, so there will be a point when justice will be served. By, you know. So hopefully, Kongamano Lamageus will be in power at some point, and they can allow uh, for a judicial, independent judicial inquiry to take place. Only then will you be able to have justice. I hear people telling me that um, you should tweet the evidence and put at risk the people who have gone out of their way to mm. put that, that data together. For what? So that Kenyans can be happy that you have seen it on Twitter. And then do what? Do nothing about it. Uh, just satisfy your curiosity that you have seen the information. There's already enough information that people have Mm -hmm. that I am not going to risk the lives of more of my staff, my former staff in the commission, of other good Whitney Kenyans who have shared the evidence. I'm not going to risk it just for the satisfaction of a few people who want to see a few clicks on Twitter 
that mm-hmm. they that they have information. No, absolutely not. Uh, that information will be provided only to right. an independent judicial investigation that is able to do something with the information. Thank you so much. Um, you know, before we connected, I didn't. You know, whenever you know about somebody uh, because of the work they do, and then you know you you learn more and then get excited about them and then finally get to meet them. I didn't know you'd be such an humble human being, you know. <laughs> and somebody who it's enjoyable to talk to you. I think we could talk for a long time. But uh, why is it that you're so humble? Where do you get this humility from? I, I don't take it that I'm humble, Simon. I don't, I don't feel it at all. Oh. I think you're just, you're just making the conversation much easier easier to have it's it's credit to you also as, uh-huh. as a host uh, because, <laughs> because you could you could do you could uh, you could you could make it difficult for a conversation to take place yeah. but i think it's also you know i mean it's really i mean i didn't grow up in a dynasty i didn't grow up in a rich family i grew up yeah. in a you know in your kawaita family where these these are things you're you're taught these are values that are um, that 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 i think you grow up with i mean i'm sure Many people will say the same about you, Simon. Uh, they will talk about uh, your humility and, uh, and 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 your you know your kawaida personness because that's who you are. You, 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 you know right. that's how you grew up. That's those are the ideals you grew up with. Maybe if I grew up in state house uh, all my life, maybe I would be different. But I didn't grow up there. I grew up in uh, you know in Mwembe Tayari. Right. Which, which you could consider slum in, in, right. in the standards of Kisi town. Right. But, uh, you know, so, so I have no choice but to be who I am, right? Right. I love Kisi. Every time I've gone there, you know, I've, I've just... It, it's an exciting place, you know? It's really like Seattle because of how rainy it is there and how it's just green all the time. Uh, and, did, they, you know, did they give you sweet, sweet bananas to eat when you went there? It, yeah, you know, we bought them and took them with us to Kisumu, but also, you know, Kisumu was filled with Kisi people, you know, like Gesoko area. I have cousins that are Kisis that are also here in the U.S., in New Jersey, um, mm. you know, so, yeah. You look yeah. at Nyamasaria, yes. around, every, you know, around Kisumu, yeah. Nyamasaria, that's, that's uh, we're one people in the end. Right, right. We played soccer with so many Kisis who speak Luo fluently. They participate exactly. in the Luo culture even more than Luo people. Uh, mm. So, so many of them. Now I want you to just, um, you know, speak to me about integrity. You know, I worked with the third largest logistics company here in the U.S. that is known because of how they are doing things by the book, you know. So when I, you know, when I've been looking at your story and learning and researching about the work you've been doing, integrity is the thread that is holding all of it. Um, mm-hmm. There are three former commissioners that were appointed as ambassadors. These are your colleagues, people that you are, you know, discussing ideas and how to make Kenya's electoral system work better. You know. And so the other day you tweeted and said, rest in peace, electoral justice. And it sounded like you're giving up while you're somebody that I think is very tough. You know, (laughs) 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 what's going on? And uh, speak to us a little bit about integrity as well. (laughs) I mean, um, I think we, you know, speaking about integrity, I think that is all you have. Your name is all you have. Um, Mm. You know, if you... If you can't say what if you can't if you can't be who you are if you can't stand by the truth if you can't do what is right mm. I don't know what is left of you so for me that's it's the essence of what makes you the person you are Thank and you. and and I think it's again it goes back really to my upbringing it goes back to you know my mother is a very strong seventh day Adventist who always reminds us about these things um, my dad is Catholic, by the way, so I have grown up both in the Catholic uh, tradition and, and the Seventh Day Adventist. Mm. Uh, you know, but those are things that you grow up being. You know, you're being reminded all the time, and, and right. so it is who you are. Right. And um, I wanted know, to speak- actually add another question um, that is related to that, but it's from Chris Christopher Sakwa, 
who is a part of the Kenya Boys Choir. Uh, he, he lives in Seattle. It's great that he's joined us for this conversation, but he's asking, what do you think Kenya should do to avoid the same computer error in 2017? If I was to advise any political party is to just say, because it wasn't a computer error. You know, a computer error is when a mistake is made. Mm. But this was deliberate, right? Mm. So I would go to going back to the basics. Mm. Let's go manual. Mm. Uh, I do not see how, and I said this actually very openly when I was having, whenever I had conversations with the, with the, with the, with NASA at the time. Mm. And I would say to them, I do not understand which opposition party in Africa mm. would want results to be transmitted electronically mm. when the state controls the internet, when the, the state controls the infrastructure. Mm. So how you avoid that, frankly, is not by going and buying better technology from from uh, Otimofo or Safran or whatever they are, or they are now co calling themselves uh, Idemia. Uh, mm -hmm. They have changed their names three times since I left uh, the, the commission. Mm -hmm. So that is not how you do it. It's not, it's not by going and getting the technology to be better because the problem wasn't the technology. The mm -hmm. problem was the manipulation of the technology, mm -hmm. intentional manipulation of the, of the technology. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can address it through different ways. You can put measures uh, in place that are, are able to monitor the technology. But that is tougher when you're dealing with a state and a state that is keen to keep... Um, you know, to come to keep power. But I would actually advocate for a manual, a manual transmission of results. Let's go back to the basics. Let's do right. it uh, the way we did it before. You can be able to trace because it's the forms that you are able to follow. I mean, I, I have put down a few ideas in my end of assignment report on some of the things that you can do to improve uh, really the, the legitimacy of, of the results. And, mm. and, and just relying on technology and calling it a computer glitch doesn't cut it it's not enough. right right well thank you thank you so much uh for spending a lot of time with me today i really appreciate it and i want to make sure we can talk again i want you to just share with our listeners and our viewers um how they can learn more about your work and how they can stay connected with you no thank you thank you thank you first uh simon i think you're doing a good job i've been looking up uh, the work that you're doing with One Vibe, and uh, and if there's anything I can do, I, Kisumu is very dear to me. As I said to you, I I, I call Dunga home. Uh, that is where we we all go when we're saying we're going home. So Kisumu mm -hmm. is a place that is special to me. So if there's any work you're doing around Kisumu, do let us know, and 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 we'll provide any support. Uh, we have an Akombe Foundation that mm -hmm. is mostly run by my siblings. I I have no direct connection to it. It's but there are, there are things that the Akombe Foundation can do together with you to make uh, to, to do some work uh, in, in Kisumu with, uh, with One Vibe and other parts of, of Kenya. In terms of the, Thank know, you so of much. my work, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always very open. I speak very openly on, uh, on Twitter, so I can always be, uh, you know, you can find me on my Twitter handle, Dr. Roslyn uh, Akombe. I, I also try and, uh, you know, keep myself uh, uh, busy with, um, you know, updating things around on my on my website. I'm not very good at doing that, rosalinacombe.com. My brother helps me out. I'm not very good at updating it. But um, if you want to know more about what I'm doing, that's where you'll see it. But more importantly, I, I am trying to save the world every day working with the United Nations. So you can follow the work uh, that we're doing there and uh, I'm actually looking forward to a very challenging and interesting um, 2021. work in the next year yeah. in 2021 I'm going to be focusing more on development work you'll be seeing shortly I you know I might make a move uh, somewhere away from New York uh, but, mm. uh, but, but yeah we'll continue working and serving the world to make it a better place Wow well I, I wanted to say that um, you know, not many leaders like you admit when they don't know how to do something. <laughs> uh, and you just say that you don't know how to update your website and da, da 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 and you get help. That's amazing. So for our viewers and our listeners, please uh, always feel that it's okay 
to not do be able to do everything you know there is always this pressure that when you're presenting yourself on uh you know to the public you appear as if you are perfect but it's okay not to be perfect sometime so with that uh, i just want you to know that it was really a privilege to be here with dr rosalina kombe as well as the viewers and listeners of the african father in america podcast uh Again, we talked about Dr. Ro- Ro- Rosalina Kombe's story. We talked about, uh, you know, what a father figure means to her. And we talked about her passion uh, as a political economist. And uh, we talked about how you can connect with her. So with that, I want to thank you again uh, for, you know, spending your evening uh, with me. And I'll be reaching out again in the near future. Thank you. Thank Happy you. New Year. Thank you very much. Happy New Year to you. Thanks. Thank you. Father in America. Jujikaze, jujikaze, jikaze. Jujikaze, jujikaze, jikaze. African father in America.